Welcome to Doing the Most, the series where we talk about the misadventures of entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Georgie, execution strategist and serial entrepreneur. This series is here to get real about what entrepreneurial life truly looks like. We are driven, persistent, hardworking, ambitious. We are human, and these are our stories. Welcome back to Doing the Most, The Misadventures of Entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Georgie, and today our guest is AJ Adams. He's a entrepreneur, a dad, and a doer out here in the ecosystem getting it done. And so, AJ, can you share us your story and a little bit about your background of what kind of brought you where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you having me on. So my background, or I'll tell you what I do, and then I'll give a little background to how I got here. Uh, so I work with entrepreneurs and I show them how to generate hundreds of thousands of dollars doing little more than telling their story and mm-hmm. sharing their knowledge and expertise. And I do that by teaching them how to create influence, impact, and income through high ticket personal branding, high ticket offer, and then getting high ticket clients in 45 days or less. And so I, I got to this space uh, with what I'm doing now, actually kind of by necessity. I started as a motivational speaker. I was a youth pastor before that, and I wanted to reach kids who were outside of uh, the church context, schools, colleges, uh, student leadership conferences. And in doing that, I had to figure out how do I get people to pay attention? How do I convince people that I have value to give and that they should pay me thousands of dollars to be on stage? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I'm not a celebrity, uh, not a millionaire. At the time, I wasn't a uh, published author. I really didn't have anything that was a crazy story that everyone else had. Because I studied the top motivational speakers, the top uh, entrepreneurs, and I didn't have any of what they had. So what I did was I dove into uh, obsessively studying branding, marketing, uh, social media, content creation. And I just started putting out content. I started positioning myself. I started... I built a website myself on on Wix, horrible looking website. <laughs> created a demo. I did, I did. I put all the pieces in place. They, none of them looked great, and eventually I got really good at it to the point where I was getting booked on stages. And not only was I getting booked on stages, uh, other speakers and coaches and entrepreneurs were asking me, reaching out to me, asking for advice. Mm-hmm. How are you putting your content? Uh, who's your social media manager? Can you recommend them? And I was doing it all myself. So that opened up the opportunity for me to do some coaching uh, with other speakers and other consultants. Um, then that opened up for consulting uh, with brands. Eventually that led to a business partnership, co-authoring a book and uh, working with a gentleman who's called, he goes by the $6 billion man because he generated over $6 billion for um, brands, for celebrities like Jennifer Lopez, uh, Nicki Minaj, Adam Levine, Tommy Hilfiger. Uh, currently, he's partnered with Tom uh, with uh, Damon John. So all of that fast forward has now led me to where I'm at now, where I focus on teaching other entrepreneurs how to do what I've done uh, and turn their knowledge and expertise into a high ticket offer, create their high ticket advantage, and then uh, launch that to help transform lives. Awesome, thank you. And so we're gonna take a little step back. So when I was like you know getting some more details about you i saw that you kind of started as like a janitor so like that and you mentioned just now you like you were a youth minister so can you tell us a little bit of how you went from janitor youth minister to motivational speaker and you mentioned a slight bit of like you know you wanted to reach like a wider audience but what made that combination like what got you to that combination and made you realize you want to do more than what you were currently doing yeah, so I worked as a janitor uh, while I was working as a youth pastor. So I was working two jobs. Um, collectively, I was making, in Southern California, about $40,000 a year. Uh, half of that uh, monthly income was just my rent. And the rest uh, didn't even cover, cover all of our other expenses, uh, bills and uh, groceries. So that's where I had to get the, the second job. So I was making 12 bucks an hour, uh, probably about $1,500 a month, working as a janitor full-time. Uh, in addition to uh, working as a youth pastor. I had started my speaking business about a year before that, mm-hmm. and uh, I only had maybe one or two speaking engagements. So I was still hustling hard, trying to figure out how to get that business going. Really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I invested in a couple of coaching programs, 
uh, some courses and got a little bit of traction, but ultimately um, I was just burning through a lot of money. And uh, the one thing that I did do during that season was I had such an irrational belief that I was going to be successful, mm -hmm. that I spent all my time, every lunch hour, uh, every break, uh, I go clean the toilets, I mop the floors, and then I go and I read, I would study. I was listening to audio books. I was listening to uh, trainings. I was listening to uh, Tony Robbins, Robert Kiyosaki, uh, Eric Thomas. I was listening to sermons because I knew that in order for me to get to the place I wanted to be in business and in life, I had to change my mindset. I had to educate myself. So I started listening to Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, to learn about finance, uh, listening to Tony Robbins to learn about business, uh, listening to uh, talks from Zig Ziglar, Art Williams, and Eric Thomas to just get my success mindset mm -hmm. uh, correct. And so I invested in all of that. That's what I did obsessively and then just started implementing. And at the same time, I was working as a gender. I was writing my first book uh, on student success. So it was called The Other Half of Student Success. And it was all about how do you build success? Uh, and the interesting thing was I wasn't successful at the time in any respect, mm -hmm. but I, the reason I wrote it was because I was documenting what I was doing because I was that sure that it was going to happen. And like, how did that, that process feel? Like, was there any like outside factors that was like impacting this? Um, like, you know, what, what, were, what were your like, you know, family saying? What were friends saying when you were like doing all these things? Like, you know, you're aggressively studying, you're writing a book about success and, you know, they're like, but you're not successful. So what was that experience like? And um, yeah. th what kind of feedback did you get from people that were around you? So for me, it was more internal. Um, I did make, you know, I had a great uh, community of people around me. Um, and that's one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs don't do soon enough is surround themselves with the right environment, other like-minded people. I had a lot of like-minded people around me. Uh, some were entrepreneurs, you know, some were um business people who ran businesses, but I was surrounded by people who were supportive. Um, the, the greatest struggle was myself. That's where the doubts were. Uh, my wife was encouraging, you know, we had two kids at the time. So it was me, my wife and two kids while I was working as, you know, trying to provide for us on a janitor uh, salary. And, um, you know, 12 bucks an hour doesn't go very far when you've got kids. And uh, when your car breaks down, uh, we had to sell one of our cars uh, to pay rent in one month. And that was while the other car was broken down mm. um, for six months. So, you know, the obstacles were just life, just circumstances. And fortunately, it wasn't people, it wasn't the doubters and haters. Uh, and, you know, I've never, I've always cut those people out. Uh, that's, I've just never paid attention. And I just pushed those people away and surrounded myself with positive influences, which is massively important. Uh, um, but the reason, and that I was pushing for it was be there was one specific moment that I that really pushed me and made me realize I need to take control of my life and change everything. I was sitting in the parking lot of a Taco Bell restaurant with my wife and my two daughters, and in that parking lot, I literally reevaluated my life because I was uh, about 27, 28 at the time. I'm 36 now, and uh, so it was about eight, eight or so years ago, and. <sighs> I couldn't buy lunch. I couldn't afford to buy tacos to feed my family. And that's when I realized I got to change something. Mm -hmm. We had $5.38 on our name. Our bank account was negative, $250. And from that moment on, my mindset shifted. I started getting really intentional about educating myself, about building, about learning. And it was a hard road, still been a hard road, uh, because when you're building something from nothing, and you don't have all the advantages, it's extremely difficult. Uh, it's even more so difficult when you have a spouse and you have kids and you add all of those things. Um, but if you're willing to do it, you're willing to put in the work, you can make things happen. So we're, we're always building, we're always pushing forward. I love that. And like you said, like just realizing that you have to change something, you know, because a lot of people might feel like, oh, if this thing happens in my life or if that thing happens in my life, then I'll be able to do this. I'll have the opportunity to do that. But just recognizing that you have to be the change that you want to see, even if you don't, like you say, you're writing the book about success because you're, you know, you're going to be successful. It's not about being successful right now. And you know, right now you have $5 and like you said, 38 cents, but you know, you're going to have more money than that. So just investing that energy and like, 
be more pre um, prepared, right? So creating the opportunity for yourself versus kind of waiting for an opportunity to be handed down to you. So when you started right. like on this journey now, so you're like reading these books, you're listening to these audiobooks, podcasts, educating yourself, and you, you know, you have this crappy website out, up. What were some of like the things that you started doing to kind of get out there to let people know like, oh, this is not just a bunch of fluff. This is like a real thing. I've actually put the work in. Let me help you. And why should you trust me? So how did you start getting like those first clients? Um, and what was that like journey like? Yeah. So those first clients were speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was just all uh, sending a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls. I would go online. I knew the organizations that I wanted to speak for, which at the time were student leadership organizations. Okay. So I would go to, I would Google them um, for each state. I would look up the main website. And what I did was I compiled a spreadsheet of emails and contacts. And every day I was emailing, I was reaching out. I was having conversations uh, to, to let people know what I was doing and that I was available. And the, the key part of it was, and I still teach this today, you have to know, know your audience, mm -hmm. know what they're looking for, know what they value and how to communicate to them that you can offer that value. So that's what I did. I obsessively studied it and I reached out and I just kept, kept grinding at it. Nice. And when did when did you knew when did you know like you were onto something and like throughout that process when did you decide to leave your job and you know did, did you did you still do um the youth ministry uh, you know were you still like a youth pastor or did you have to leave those things behind and when at what point did you know that 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 phase was not over you had to like let go of it even though that was like the security that you knew for this like dream and this like system that you were building yeah so there there was two two um, milestone events. Uh, the first one, uh, when I was working as a youth pastor and janitor, um, I knew we had to make a change uh, when uh, my good friend, who was the pastor, uh, I'd known him for years before. I was at his wedding, he was at mine, and uh, he sat me down and uh, he said, AJ, uh, you look like crap. We can't do this anymore. Mm. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> And he, he said, AJ, we can't do this anymore. And he fired me. Mm. And I, I have, to this day, still respect him. Uh, I was actually hanging out with him uh, last month at an event. Uh, we're both part of the same uh, mastermind group now. Uh, but I respected him because he valued me more than what I did, more than my role. And so many entrepreneurs struggle because they don't have people who value them mm. above what they bring to the table. So he supported me over and over again. He's he's used his plus one at five thousand dollar masterminds to bring me uh, to expose me to the right people and training uh, throughout the years. Um, but that, that moment uh, when he he fired me because he saw that the role I was in wasn't serving me or my family well, and it wasn't mm. it was it was tearing me apart. Eventually, that was going to great more greatly affect my family. So uh, that same probably just a. That might have been like November, October of 2012, uh, 2013, uh, January. I moved my family. We took our last $500, rented a U-Haul truck, packed everything up, and then moved ourselves back to uh, the Phoenix, Arizona area where my family is and uh, where we live now uh, because my wife was also six months pregnant at the time. So mm -hmm. there were a lot of different challenges, um, but we packed up. And, and we in the middle of the school year and we left and we moved back to, to start over. So that was one of the first milestones. Uh, when I, the second one is when I actually left my full-time job. So uh, after we got back to Arizona, lived with my parents for about a month or so, um, then I finally got a solid job. My wife got a job. Uh, I was selling cars. I was uh, doing sales, cold calling for a startup company before they crashed and burned. Um, <laughs> and then I finally got a, a job selling insurance, uh, for, uh, one of the biggest insurance, uh, carriers in the country. Uh, so doing that, I excelled. I was a top performer. I was moving up. I pretty much giving, given up on speaking, uh, for about a year. Okay. And then when I finally did decide to pick it back up, it's because I got involved with Toastmasters at that same company and it kind of reignited the spark to start speaking again. And uh, I went back at it. I, I invested uh, with another coach, 
uh, who turned me on to branding, which is kind of where that whole thing started. Uh, it was just a comment he made. I said, what do I need to do to get, you know, to increase my speaking fee and get bigger, get on bigger stages? He said, you need to improve your brand. So that's when I really started obsessively studying branding, when I really got deep into it, more so than I ever had. And um, I ended up booking more speaking engagements. And the point where I left my job was where I had two speaking engagements booked, contracts written, uh, inked. Each one of those was going to pay me the equivalent of a month's salary. Mm. And I used up, I burned through all my PTO time. Uh, I had, I asked my manager, can I take unpaid time off? And she said, no, we can't do that. Okay, well, I'm a top performer. You know, I do my job. I've got these speaking engagements. She knew I was doing this on the side. Mm -hmm. Why, what can I do? There's nothing I can do for you. She did everything but tell me, you're going to have to either quit your job or cancel these contracts. Oh, okay. So I was left with the choice. And <laughs> I said, okay, deuces. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> And uh, two weeks later, or the next day, actually, I, I called my wife that same day, uh, told her the situation. She said, do what you think is best. That same day, I wrote a letter of resignation, turned it in, and uh, gave my two-week notice. Um, they gave me about two minutes, and then they walked me out. <laughs> so that, that was when I, when I took the leap, because um, I had to. And, you know, case in point, there is no right time. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that are going to listen to this. And they're looking for, well, when's the right time? When's the right time? There is no right time. Mm -hmm. you, you just got to jump at some point and then be willing to do whatever you take, whatever it takes, learn to fly on the way down. Uh, because I hit the road hard and it wasn't easy. I made so many mistakes. It wasn't ideal. I had a family to take care of. I had three kids then. Um, but you do it right, whatever it takes. And that's what separates the winners from the losers, successful people from those who are not successful. You just jump and you're willing to do whatever you have to do to make it happen. Exactly. And I love that um, mentality of just like, you, you know, that's just how it is. And uh, we have this like idea that successful people, they had a roadmap. And even if they did have, you know, family and friends that were like supportive or invested in their ideas or supported them through like the business journey, it still took them saying, I'm going to take that leap of faith to get started. Yeah. I'm going to go out there. And even if it doesn't work out, I'm going to keep on going out there because Absolutely. I can't. The family and the haters mm -hmm. and doubters and naysayers, those won't be your biggest obstacle. Your biggest obstacle will be you and your hangups, your mental blocks, your doubts, the, your negative self-talk. That will be the biggest obstacle. If you conquer that, then it doesn't matter what anybody says. Yep. And that's, I define confidence this way, and this is important for anyone to understand. Confidence is knowing you'll get it done mm -hmm. even when you don't know how you'll get it done. Mm. That's what real confidence is. And sometimes you have to just, you, you have to just embody that and step into it. Now, I'm about to uh, make, do some bigger things. I'm about to launch my first event that I've been putting off for uh, three years now. And I'm completely confident that we're gonna do it, that it's gonna work out, because I've decided that it's gonna work out and I'm doing whatever I have to do to make it happen. And I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna ask you about your misadventure first but 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 first when i was doing like a little bit of research to learn a little bit more about you i came across your social media and on the social media yeah. a couple weeks ago when they had the little graphics about you know this is my linkedin picture my facebook picture um, <laughs> my twitter icon and then farmers only can we talk about that <laughs> <laughs> oh i didn't expect anybody to pull that out uh you know, I kept <laughs> this is the misadventures right so <laughs> it was a yeah like you know it was a trend uh, I kept seeing it around. I, I was just sitting down one day and just, uh, you know, I like to goof off my family and friends who know me well know that I'm a big goofball. Uh, and I'm, I can be sarcastic and like make a lot of jokes. I like to put fun of things. So I kept seeing these memes mm -hmm. where it was LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and then Tinder. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would never be on Tinder, obviously. But then I thought, <laughs> well, uh, farmersonly.com. So I, I remembered I had this photo. And the photo you saw was from that apartment I was living in in Southern California mm -hmm. when I was working as a janitor and as a youth pastor. That was one of our youth uh, team meetings. Um, somebody, man, I don't remember what happened. Someone made a comment. And in the photo, uh, I've got sweats on. I've got a sleeveless white tee. I've got a do-rag on. And uh, I've got my, my, the left pant leg pulled up, you know, true hood style. And I'm making <laughs> a good face. Uh, what I think you can't see in the photo is that 
I believe if I, I have to look at it again, but I believe I had taken some tin foil and I had made a grill and I had that in my oh, mouth man. in the photo, but you might not be able to see it because it's, it's too small. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that, that's what that photo was. So I just threw it up and thought, I'm just gonna throw this up because it's funny. And uh, it, got, it got a good reaction from people on social media. Yeah, I, I had never heard of like farmersonly.com. Like how did you hear about this website? Oh, TV you, commercials. Is that one of your clients? TV commercials, internet commercials. Um, I don't know how why they're targeting me. They're obviously they need to their marketing team needs to calibrate um, <laughs> because uh, maybe there was a running joke that um, FarmersOnly.com. I think it was the the show Family Guy. Uh, they okay. made a joke about it and they poked fun at it and said eh, it's, it's, it doesn't say white people only, but mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I was <laughs> I was poking fun at it, at it for for multiple reasons. Multiple angles. Guys, I'm not even going to talk um, too much about it, but everyone that's out there listening, go check out FarmersOnly.com. It'll blow your mind because um, yeah. city folks just don't get us. Yeah, it's, it's exactly <laughs> what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so I just had to bring that up. I was just like, I've never seen this before, and it was just like a new piece of information to me. So now we're about like halfway through. So this is the time I usually ask about, you know, what do you think is one of your biggest entrepreneurial misadventures that you've experienced that, you know, it could be something that you've shared already publicly or maybe you haven't shared that you think is important for folks out there to know this story, a part of your journey versus just looking at you and saying, yeah. oh, he's successful, but this crazy thing happened. And like, how did you overcome it? Yeah, so biggest misadventure uh, recently, I mean, there've been so many. That's I me, mean, entrepreneurship. <laughs> yep, always so many. Just a journey of misadventures. <laughs> Um, it's one big misadventure, actually. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really transparent. Uh, I share all my stories. Um, that's part of my content strategy. Uh, so people really know, can be encouraged. They know that they can make it through it, that someone else has gone through it. Um, but a big one happened October of 28, uh, let's see. Yeah, October of 2018. I almost lost my business. And I, I literally, I shut everything down for six months. Mm. I, was, I was not on social media. And that's the core of my business. I wasn't on social media. I wasn't posting. I was. I just went completely dark for six months. Um, I was recovering from a broken hand. Um, and I'll, I'll share how that all ties in. But essentially what had happened, business was going well. Uh, we took on some new partnerships. We were working with a celebrity client. Um, that one client was paying us 13 grand a month uh, mm. to run their social media, do branding. We rebuilt their website. We for uh, their personal brand and their company, which is a $100 million plus company. Um, so things are going well, uh, but then things got tough. Mm -hmm. uh, just the normal, you know, misadventures of a business, figuring out how to be profitable, figuring out how to deal with tough clients. Um, you know, with that client was paying us 13000 a month. Uh, we were making no profit on it because mm. our business partners at the time and we, me, me my wife, and then... Uh, Someone that we had working for us too was we were vetting. We gave him a year, and if we all agreed he, that he really added value, he's going to get third of the company. Um, so he was our main graphic designer. And after around September, June, he started getting really focused on where's the money? Where's the money? When, when are we going to pay? When am I going to pay? He was getting consistently paid every single month. Um, it wasn't as much as he wanted, and none of us, you know, I wasn't paying myself as much. My wife, was working a full-time job and then I'm on my way to Vegas I had just launched my podcast I'm on my way to Vegas to interview um, a big celebrity guest and I get an email resignation from him mm. no phone call nothing so I immediately call him and I'm thinking okay you know you've been you had a lot of complaints lately um, if you want to leave that's cool let me give you my blessing let me see how I can support you that was my approach let me see how I can support you how I can help you launch from this because when I met him he was designing logos for $50 websites for $300 in a year span I taught him how to adjust his personal brand how to build his personal brand how to position himself to where he was doing the same amount of work same kind of website same quality uh, somewhat even better and charging $5,000 for wow. it, charging wow. hundreds of dollars for a logo uh, so completely transformed his life and his brand, his biz, his side of the business, um, and what he was doing, and he resigned. So I thought, okay, I helped you. Let me launch you and be supportive. No response. Left a voicemail, sent text message. No response. Nothing. Uh, replied to the email. Nothing. Just went completely dark. 
blocked me on social media, blocked wow. my wife, blocked uh, mutual friends that I had introduced him to, um, held our clients hostage, wouldn't respond, stole a company laptop, uh, cost us almost $10,000 in damages and uh, lost business. And uh, to the point where I had to get the cops involved to go over to his house to get the laptop back. And then he, he claimed that it was given to him in lieu of payment, which and I told the officer, I have documentation that I, pay, that I pay him every month and he has no claim to that laptop. Officer didn't want to deal with it. So he said, well, it's not criminal, it's civil. You're gonna have to take it to court. Okay, well, thank you for nothing. And so I just let it go. I just wasn't worth the time or effort. And you know, when, you, when you're that kind of person, um, you're willing to steal and, and cheat and lie, it's gonna come back. You're, you're setting yourself up for failure. So I let it go. Um, but it, it was a hard hit. Um, yeah, definitely has my, to be. Yeah, my pride, it's just one I invested in. Yeah, I think of the, I forget which Rocky movie it is, but where he's, you know, he's training this young kid, Tommy the Machine Gun, and he teaches him, you know, how to, how to box. He, he, he makes him into a boxer. And then the kid turns his back on him, betrays him, and then comes after him. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. So I completely betrayed, betrayed my wife, uh, my son, who was uh, four or five at the time, four years old at the time, looked up to this guy, um, was always asking, when's, when's he coming over? Like, and he never did that with people. Mm -hmm. So he, we built a relationship beyond business. And uh, so I was hurt and betrayed when he just proved that he didn't value the relationship at all. Wow. So I, I went dark on social media. Uh, he posted some things about me. Um, I, I threatened to sue. Uh, then he quickly took those things down. But uh, it hurt my reputation, hurt my business. And so I went dark. And there was a day when I just lost it. My wife was asking me, what are we going to do? You know, she's just asking. She, she's concerned. She wants to know what we're going to She's my business partner. And I lost it. And just an anger. And I have a martial arts background. So I'm, I'm always careful to control, you know, my emotions to stay even keel. My, my wife, even last night, we were talking and she said, she made a comment how I'm always even keel, no matter what the situation, no matter what the stress. That takes a lot of practice and a lot of discipline and work. But in that moment, uh, a couple of years ago, I lost it. Took a swing at a bookshelf, which is still here behind me. I keep it just as a memory. It has no visible signs of damage whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what's going to happen. It's a bookshelf. <laughs> is that? Well, I thought it was a cheap bookshelf. Apparently, <laughs> it's pretty damn strong. I took a swing at it, and I broke uh, the two smaller bones in my hand. You can't see it now, but I am breaking two bones in my hand. Uh, stupid, just emotional reaction, and had four rods placed in my hand. Surgery, cast. Oh. Um, yeah, so it took a long time. I still haven't fully recovered. Um, it's been over since I, since it happened, it's been almost a year and a half now. Uh, um, so I, I still don't have full range to close my hand. Um, you know, I've, I still, it's, you know, still tight, still aches at times. But um, that's it's part of the journey. Um, you make dumb mistakes. Uh, you let things get the best of you. But then you reevaluate and you look at how did I let this happen? Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I, I blamed uh, him for a long time. The guy who left and betrayed us. I blamed situations. I, all these things, I got depressed and then I got over it. Not instantly, but I realized I need to take responsibility. Yeah, I'm going to take ownership. Mm -hmm. So I, I dove deep and I looked at what do I need to change? How do I need to become better? Uh, so now, you know, habits that I have that I didn't have then. Um, I stripped last quarter of 2019. You know, my business recovered. We ended up doubling our, the size of our business, um, new partners, new clients. Uh, 2019 was a, a much better year. Um, and we've done, you know, over six figures consecutively the last few years. Uh, we'll hit close to seven in 2020. Um, but part of it is I learned from the, the mistakes and in 2019, Q4 stripped 80% of our business. 80% of what I was, what services we offered, what we were doing, all business partners, all clients gone and wow. stripped it down just to the 20% that has always been the most impactful and most pro profitable, which is coaching, coaching entrepreneurs, uh, getting on stages, teaching them how to leverage their expertise, how to get high ticket clients. Um, that's what I'm now focused on.
Um, I read every day. I read a book a week, uh, journal every day, uh, run every day or walk. I, I do a mile or, or I walk two miles, uh, depending on the day, I usually alternate. And um, I'm on a, a fast from energy drinks and soda right now. Uh, it's just lemon water. I dropped 15 pounds in the first 45 days of this year. And then in the next 30, 45 days, we'll drop another 15. So just taking control of everything. I committed that this year I'm going to take control of my whole health. I uh, went and saw a doctor, dealt with some emotional health issues, um, spiritual health, relationship, everything. Awesome. That's really good to hear. And and I love the fact that, you know, you realize what's happening. You know, sometimes it does take like that jolt of something external um, happening for you to realize, whoa, like I'm letting the situation control me, control my life. How can I take back ownership, take back control and realizing it's not about what that guy did to us, but about how I'm reacting and how I'm letting that impact my life because he, you know, he's going to go on and keep living and he has it's already right. done on his side right and it's yeah. like the only person that could be hurt worse from it is myself if i don't realize what's happening and just again take ownership take control and seek whatever assistance i need and do whatever actions that i need to make sure that i get back on the right track that's best for me my life my family um so that's really good and really important and i thank you so much for sharing that story because a lot of times people want to hide these stories and it's like no that's a it's a part of it that doesn't make you a bad person because of something going wrong or not going the way you expected it to be but what this determines like good people from people that are just you know gonna stick in that pain is like what you do about it right anything can happen to anybody but what you do about it how you and how you respond to it and how you let it affect you in the rest of your life is gonna be that the the moment that changes everything um, so we're coming to the end of our interview, but I wanted to ask you two questions. You know, how has your experience being like a, a, a dad and Pat, as, as well as, you know, you say your wife is your business partner. How is the experience being like parent entrepreneurs? Um, and like, how do you feel that it's impacting your children? Um, you know, my wife and I have had a lot of conversations about this, especially times when we've struggled financially. Um, my kids have seen my ups and downs. And so my kids are, I have two daughters and a son. My daughters are uh, soon to be 16. Um, and by the time this episode comes out, she'll be 16. Uh, my other youngest daughter is 10. And my son is, uh, he'll be six. So they've seen the journey, but what we constantly tell them is pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I told them this multiple, many times, pay attention. Cause it looks hard now, but you'll see what happens when mom and dad are consistent when we continue to work hard. And they've gotten, you know, we've done things, taking them to resorts. And uh, we went to, uh, for my son's birthday, um, or my daughter's birthday, we went to uh, Monster Jam, big monster truck show. <laughs> and in those moments, you know, I'll ask them questions. Was this fun? Would you want to do more of this? Did you enjoy this? And I say, yes, 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 it was awesome. This is why dad and mom work so hard. Mm -hmm. So that we have the freedom to do this. My daughter wants to go to a soup kitchen uh, to go serve people. Um, I have her reading a book um, every week. She's reading every single day. She's journaling every single day. Uh, she's in sports, so she gets her fitness in. My wife reads every day. Um, so it's impacted our entire family because our kids have been able to see what it takes to build something. Uh, and we're about to, like I mentioned, about to do our first live event. So my kids will be there. They'll get to see that. And I want them to have that experience. My daughter will work the event uh, with us. She'll work the registration table. She'll work the back of the room because I want her to have the experience of seeing how you go from nothing to something very significant. Um, that I think is more valuable. And I'm glad that they didn't grow up in advantage outside of having parents who were relentlessly um, chasing and building. Yeah, and it's, and it sets a great example because, like, again, my children also do the same. They see the things that I'm doing and then, you know, I'll see them, like, having like playtime and then they're like playing with like a keyboard right like which right. you know toddler or you know young child does that and then they'll see and understand these things to hopefully you know instill some skills into them and let them know what's of value versus like what's just extra what's just fluff so you know that's great that you're sharing that and then the last question i have for you today for our interview is if listeners got nothing at all from this interview what would be the one takeaway homework item task that you, and or advice you'd want to leave them with so that they could take with them and i know they didn't get nothing but just in you know yeah if we wanted to sum it up like what would that last piece of information you want to share with the audience be it would be 
that your story, your knowledge, your expertise can transform lives. Mm. Take that, tell your story, share your knowledge, share your expertise, create what I call the high ticket advantage. It's when you know how to turn it into a product, monetize it so that you can help people, so you can make an income from it. Uh, and that's exactly what I teach people to do. And I have a new book coming out uh, called The High Ticket Advantage, How to Ditch the Low Ticket Life, Monetize Your Knowledge, and Finally Get Paid What You're Truly Worth. Because there are so many people who have an incredible story and they have so much knowledge to share if they only knew how to turn that into a high ticket advantage. The way that I did, just sharing my story, that's all I did. I shared my story, I shared my knowledge, I taught people and I just have continued to do the same thing. My whole career has been built on that. That's creating a high ticket advantage. And if you can do that, you'll never be broke, you'll always have opportunity, and more importantly, you'll make a massive impact and transform lives. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And guys, in the comments and notes section, you'll see all of um, AJ's information for how to reach out to him. And potentially if the book is out by the time we launch this episode, the link for the book will be there or just link to follow up with his newsletter so that we will get notified of when the book is live. Thank you so much for being here with us today, AJ. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me on. And I'll see you guys on the next episode of Doing the Most Misadventures of Entrepreneurship. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Doing the Most. Catch us here next week, same time, same place. If you can't wait, head on over to doingthemost.xyz to stay connected. Until next time, keep on doing.